role of women in mob is probably a lot bigger than one might suspect. The reality is women have played a role in the mafia on many different levels. In this short doc, we're going to talk about a few women whose role was beyond important, not just to the mafia, but also to the streets. And we're going to begin in Harlem, New York, with the one and only Stephanie St. Clair. Stephanie St. Clair arrives in Harlem, New York from Montreal in 1912. Within a few months of her arrival and her relationship going sour, Stephanie begins to raise up her organized crime ladder by moving small-time narcotics with her new boyfriend. Stephanie was an entrepreneur in every sense of the word, and once she attained $30,000, it was time to move on. With the money for moving narcotics, she began to loan shark in Shylock. In Harlem in those days, many banks would not loan to African Americans. And Stephanie saw her way in, beginning to loan shark and bankrolling a numbers game in Harlem. She quickly became a juggernaut, completely controlling the numbers game in Harlem. She would then use that money to open up gambling halls, clubs, and more. She knew without risk, there was no reward, and she was quick to bribe police and politicians to protect her rackets, which was completely dominated by men at the time. She would in turn hire black numbers runners to keep those in her neighborhood employed. But in the mid-1920s, she was making $20,000 a year, which is almost $360,000 a year in today's time period. She also used her status in the streets to speak out against corruption and police brutality. And when local cops busted her, she would dime them out publicly, explaining that they had in fact helped her protect her policy game with bribes. And over a dozen police would be fired as a result. She knew how to play the game. As Prohibition ended, the Mafia was looking for a bigger influx of cash, and one gangster, Dutch Schultz, eyed St. Clair's rackets. Schultz at the time controlled the Bronx, but began to make inroads into Harlem. And his style was kill or beat anyone who didn't get out of his way. He thought he could move on St. Clair, but St. Clair was not going to be bullied by an Italian or a Jewish gangster. Schultz would send a message to St. Clair, pay up or else. St. Clair and her second-in-command, Bumpy Johnson, refused. Schultz would use beat cops to harass and intimidate her, but she still refused. Her response was always swift and deadly. She would have Dutch Schultz's gambling establishments firebombed and would tip off local police where Schultz was running his games. Those tips would lead to raids, and in one case, cops would raise a gambling den of Dutch Schultz, confiscating over 12 million dollars, which is an insane amount of money in that time period. St. Clair wouldn't back down. She refused to back down. With all the heat, St. Clair would uh, have to back off her public profile and did so by handing over the operations to Bumpy Johnson, who in turn made a deal with Lucky Luciano. This deal has been distorted over the years, but the truth is, Luciano was able to move into Harlem and kick back a portion of the proceeds to Johnson, and Johnson would kick back a portion of the narcotics trade to Luciano. One hand washed the other. Not only did Stephanie run the criminal rackets in Harlem, but she also lent her money and prestige to local people who needed it most. Some might say she used that to her advantage, to look a certain kind of way at least publicly. But the truth is she cared deeply about her community. While her criminal career would slowly wind down, especially after she shoots her husband over an affair and does a 10-year stretch in prison. When she hits the streets again in the 1940s, she was still insanely wealthy, getting a percentage of the criminal activity in Harlem. She basically goes back to political reform and injustice. She changed the face of criminal acumen in Harlem, and nobody since has ever been, nor will be, as powerful or as stealthy as she was. Known as a mob mole, Virginia Hill played a major role in organized crime. While she began her life in Georgia, she eventually would leave for Chicago, hoping to get into the porn industry. However, she would end up becoming just a sex worker, and it's through that that she meets Joe Epstein, who was a Chicago bookmaker and gambler. It's through Epstein that Hill goes to work for the Mafia. It's through those contacts that she meets Charlie Fischetti, Al Capone's bodyguard and hitman. The outfit needed eyes back in New York, and they would send her to New York to keep a close eye on Lucky Luciano's captain, Joe Adonis. 
Chicago wanted to keep eyes on what Luciano was up to and knew that Hill could persuade any man on earth to give up his secrets. She would bet Adonis and get all of the information Chicago needed and would funnel that information back to Capone. It's while in New York betting Adonis that she meets Benjamin Bugsy Siegel. The two would soon have a torrid and violent romance which would lead Hill to working more in depth for the mafia. Hill, who spoke fluent Spanish, would often be sent to Mexico to bed drug bosses. The mafia wanted a stranglehold on narcotics and Hill would be sent to sleep with or to get cozy with these Mexican drug bosses to get inside information for the mafia. She was also instrumental in helping arrange new narcotics routes with the Mexican drug lords. Her main job was transferring messages from one criminal boss to another and she was incredibly good at what she did. Hill would eventually find her way out west to Las Vegas as Benjamin Bugsy Siegel was taking over the rackets out there and building the infamous Flamingo Hotel. One of the problems that it was was that Siegel was lazy and didn't oversee the construction and the costs mounted and mounted and mounted. Finally, when the Flamingo opened, it bombed in Bagley. Guys back east were starting to get angry as Siegel had borrowed the money from them to start the casino. Turns out the Flamingo wasn't even completed at the time and the mob would force Siegel to shut down and finish the build. He would finish the build and the Flamingo would reopen and would actually turn a small profit, but the numbers didn't match. And as it turns out, Siegel was pilfering money off the top and not telling the mob. He was sending Virginia Hill once a week to Switzerland to deposit large amounts of cash into a bank account he thought the mafia didn't know about. Meyer Lansky, unfortunately, was tasked with finding out, and finding out he did. He would explain to Luciano that Siegel was definitely stealing and Luciano would have enough, and ordered his death despite Lansky pleading with him. Four days before Siegel's assassination, Hill, for some odd reason, took an immediate flight to France. In fact, she didn't even tell Siegel until she got there. Turns out she was tipped off that Siegel was going to get hit, and she left as quick as she found out. Over the years, it's been speculated she confirmed to Lansky what they had long suspected, that she was helping him steal money from the casino. And they only let her live because she admitted to it and because she was too crucial to organize crime at that time in Mexico. Years later, while living in Austria, she made the mistake of telling reporters that she was the former lover of Benjamin Bugsy Siegel. According to rumors, she called back to New York and told them that if they didn't hand over a ton of money, she was going to tell the papers everything about the Italian mafia. She would die of an overdose on March 24, 1966 at age 49. Her death was labeled a suicide, but there are those who believe the mob reached out and had it taken care of rather than give an inch to her. This is the face of what a female boss looks like. That's right, Maria Licciardi was the boss of a Camorra crime family known as La Madrina or La Piccolina. She became the head of the Licciardi crime family. She grew up inside of, the, of a Camorra crime family with her father and siblings all involved. Her brothers would eventually take over the crime family and her family was tied close with other Camorra clans, specifically in the narcotics trade and extortion rackets in Naples. Her brother Gennaro had become head of the family, but after he died from blood poisoning in prison, and after her husband Antonio and her brothers Pietro and Vincenzo went to prison, Maria would absorb the crime family and would lead a brutal reign. In any mob story that we often discuss, internal issues and street beefs always happen, and when Maria absorbs her family, there was the same strife and internal issues you might expect but she was a chip off the old block and was able to wrestle control and right the ship in every single way. She would unite 20 warring clans within the Camorra Syndicate to come together to expand rackets in Naples, working as one major conglomerate. Not long after, they would fully control construction, drugs, and prostitution all over Naples. The Camorra would become the most powerful organized crime faction in all of Italy. Prior to her ascension, the Camorra had outlawed prostitution as a racket, but Maria saw things a little differently. Where there was money to be made, she was all in, and they completely would end up controlling that market. One way Maria was in fact different is that she remained low-key. She knew people would be watching, she stayed underground calling the shots from the darkness, unlike many of her male counterparts. However, her calm demeanor was a stark contrast to her ability to order murder after murder after murder without hesitation. 
She looked at herself much like Rosetta Kutolo, another female mob boss who had zero patience for mistakes and ordered the death of hundreds. Under Maria, the Camorra was making millions and millions of dollars and infiltrated all aspects of the economy. Her main focus was using violence as a last resort, once telling a reporter that she would rather run it like a business without the fractures with inside the clan. In other words, business and money were the ultimate desire. Maria would seek to silence rats in any way possible. If she couldn't buy them off, she would have them killed, hands down without a second thought. Things would run smoothly for years until a disagreement over heroin would unthrone her. The heroin, heroin, which came from Turkey, was tested and found to be way too pure, and Maria didn't want it hitting the streets out of fear that it would kill people. But a rival clan, the LaRussos, did not care, and they packaged it, shipped it, and sold it anyway. And it had its effects because it would go on to kill hundreds of people, and all it brought was heat from the police. And it would force the Italian authorities to crack down on the Camorra, and the effects were felt everywhere. The Russos would end up splitting from the alliance that Maria had formed, and war would break out. Maria's stronghold was attacked by a rival clan, and four of her men would be killed. She then completely loses her shit, and within months she retaliates, killing over 120 rivals. As a result, she would then become known to police, and would go underground. She would be named the 30 one of the 30th most 30 most wanted women in, or people in Italy, criminals, excuse me, and would be protected by her family through coded messages. As the heat came in the form of prosecution against her family, she worried that she would be found. And with the nonstop prosecutions, she had to act. And what does she do? She bombs the prosecutor's office. And it was a warning to the prosecutor, stop or else. Eventually, Maria would be found in 2001. She would be sentenced to 10 years in prison, but would get out in 2008. Her brother Vincenzo took over the crime family in her absence. When she got out, she would resume control of that crime family. And despite being arrested in 2019 and 2021 in different sweeping indictments, nothing has been able to stick. And according to the Italian authorities, Maria is still the acting boss. Assunta Popeta Maresca, another female mob boss who grew up in Naples, largely dominated by a Camorra family. Her father Alberto was a Camorra smuggler, and her uncle Vincenzo was the local Camorra boss in Italy. Her uncle was a ferocious leader, and he even killed his own brother Gerardo and would get sentenced to seven years for that murder. The Maresca clan was known for controlling smuggled cigarettes in Naples and were experts in the use of switchblades, which was their method of getting rid of problems. Asunto would end up marrying into another Camorra family, as many in those days looked to marry off daughters into other strong Camorra families to strengthen the bond and their ties criminally. She would marry Pasquale Simonetti in 1955, the head of the Simonetti clan. Simonetti, by all accounts, was brash and in-your-face type who was loathed by many other Camorra members in the area, and it would lead to him being gunned down within four months of being married to Maresca. The killer, Gaetano Orlando, was actually contracted to perform that hit by the Esposito crime family. Asunta, enraged, refused to speak to police, and she would get in her car with her brother Ciro, find find Esposito, and she would blow his head off with a snub-nosed thirty-eight, reloading nonstop and shooting him 29 times in the head in broad daylight. She would go to prison for that murder, but as she gets out, she marries another Camorra boss, Umberto Amaturo. Who was, a leading, who was leading his own crime family at the time. They would go on to have children, but her son Pasquale would be murdered at 18 years old, and Maresca knew that her husband was behind that murder. By the 1980s, she left Umberto vowing to someday kill him, but she would get fully then embroiled into organized crime. She would fully back the Camorra when the war began between the Camorra and the Nuova families. She would even hold a press conference backing them publicly, which would infuriate Nuova family boss Raphael Cotolo. Cotolo, who had a stranglehold on, hold on tobacco and kickbacks, had attempted to shake down Maresca, and she replied by sending the head of a goat to his doorstep. She then would move fully into extortion, shakedowns, and fraud, not afraid of anyone or anything. 
She is widely known as the first Kimura boss in history. As Nuova family tried to gain a foothold, she would order the death of Ciro Gawi, a chief lieutenant of Raphael Cutolo. And when it came to murder, she didn't hesitate. She was willing to do it herself. In 1980, when there was a bombing in Bologna, Maresca was enraged. The scientist who had manufactured the bomb, Aldo Seminari, the name had been passed around as he was allegedly the one who made it. Maresca was so angry, she orders his death. And he was found and uh, dismembered in the town square. She did not fuck around. Under her reign, the Maresca family were juggernauts. Asunta would die at age 86 in 2021, still head of her own crime family. And one could simply say, to sum her up best, if you want something done right, you do it yourself.